Well, I thank God for all of us gathering together in his name. According to the Bible, he is right here in our midst, at work, guiding us, whatever he's doing. Riley, slide number one, please. All right, so the title of our message today, a little loud, you control the volume, okay, Riley, is... Oh, okay, what does it mean to be saved? What does it mean to be saved? And uh, we can go to that first scripture. This is the one we'll base everything on. Is in Matthew 121. Are you going to read that? I'll read this first one. And she shall bring forth a son... And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sin. Before we, uh, let me make a preliminary remark now. There are three misapprehensions in the Western world, three misconceptions about what does it mean to be saved. They're not necessarily wrong, they're just um, overemphasis that could lead to misunderstandings. You know, certain things are true, but if, they're, if you stretch them beyond their intent, they're not, no longer true. It goes for anything, okay. Now, I want to dispel the misapprehension of being saved and the quality of your life. Now, let me just say this, I'm saved, and the, uh, the quality of my life increased tremendously. You get saved, you're a changed man, and you're going to be changed for the better. Your lifestyle is going to have peace, joy, contentment, fulfillment. These things will spill over into your health, according to medical science. And you'll probably have more money in your pocket because you won't be giving that money to the bartender or the drug dealers. So without a doubt, when you get saved, the quality of your life is going to be better. But Jesus did not come to give you a better quality life. If that were true, you could be a saved sinner. You could have a better life as a sinner. You could have joy, money, health as a sinner. No, Jesus came to save you from your sins. Save me from my sins. The quality of life that ensues after that, that's just uh, that's something he throws in. Now, another misapprehension about being saved, please listen to this carefully. It's called decisionism. Now, this is an emphasis on the decision you made when you first got saved. This is an emphasis on the prayer that you said, where you said it, when it said it. Did you say this prayer at the altar, in your church, at a big crusade? Now, decisionism, most church leaders that have been around, when you see those lines of hundreds of people coming to the altar, sometimes thousands, most of those people don't go nowhere after that. This is according to church leaders. The emphasis should not be on decisionalism. It should be on discipleship. Now, I used to work on the altar of a pretty large church. Every week there was a salvation call. People went up. I did it for months probably. And do you know, uh, one day the Lord had me to start asking the people I prayed with a certain question. And that question was this. How many times have you done this? Oh, you'd be surprised the number of uh, answers I got. One woman said 50. Now, I remember um, um, I, were, I was in the Assembly of God. They were missionaries, and um, they used to send photographs of people getting baptized. And someone noticed that the same people were getting baptized next year as got baptized the year before. So, you know... The decision you make, Jesus said you must be born again. That takes a decision. However, that's not it. 
if you relate only to the decision you made and base your life on that, you're on shaky ground. You've got to be more than a decision, more than a prayer. Okay, so those are two things I want to dispel. You have to, to understand what it means to be saved. It's not about the quality of life. It's not about the decision you made. Now, it, it not, it's not about an emphasis on what is called salvation past. See, being saved, not only um, um, a decision, but number two, it's also an ongoing process. I'll show you right from the scriptures. And it also has a specific culmination. The word sozo, which means to be saved, salvation, it is in the Greek New Testament in the past tense, in the present tense, and in the future tense. So salvation is not only an initial event. It is also a continuing progress and it has a culmination or a destination. We could look at that scripture now if you would, Sister Nancy, Ephesians 2.5, and you could read it if you want. Ephesians 2.5, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Well, this is one example of how the word salvation throws us back into the past, to the day we got born again, to the day that we made that commitment. But how about Philippians 2.12 now, please? Philippians 2.12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So this is salvation in the present tense. We ought to be working on our salvation in fear and trembling. Basically means we don't want to make a mistake. We're not home yet. We are not home yet. And I tell you, if you made a commitment to Christ and said a prayer, brother, sister, you are not home yet. You are not home yet. And anyone that leads you to believe that you are home is misleading you. The statistics show that you are not home yet. All right, now, salvation also has a future culmination. There's a destination. Please, Sister Nancy, Romans 13, 11. Besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. So please, salvation is nearer to us now. That is in the future tense. Now here's what one of these great commentators, I think he was from Scotland. I don't know if it was Alexander McLaren. I think it was Matthew Henry. But he said this. Salvation past. Salvation present. Salvation future. Salvation passed when you gave your life to Christ. You were saved from the penalty of your sins. Ongoing salvation, salvation present, you are saved from the power of your sins. And one day when you reach the Lord, you're going to be saved from the very presence of sin. Now, I want to uh, just tell you why this is important to, to view salvation this way. Because this is how we live our lives and this is how we present this gospel to others. This is how we present the gospel to others as a, present, a past commitment, a present event, an ongoing process and a culmination. Now, I'm going to um, look at this subject from three different perspectives. Maybe you're saved, I hope you are, but if you're saved today and listening to this message, 
I want you to get more saved. I want you to get saved to the uttermost. Oh, you could read that, please, Sister Nancy. Hebrews 7.25. Oh, no, I don't have a slide for that. Forget it. Now, basically what we want to do is we want to fully immerse ourselves in the things of God, not just get a foot bath. It says that God is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. And, um, okay, so suppose you're not saved today. You know, it is not God's will that any should perish. We want to get you saved today. Now is the hour of salvation. Amen. Now, I want to just dwell on this a little while, this next point. Maybe you're not sure you're saved. Maybe you think you're saved and you're not saved. Well, brothers and sisters, we got to clear up this matter. This is very important. You cannot think you're saved and not be. You can't be having doubts whether you're saved. The Bible says you can be saved. Now, I'm going to quote some people. There are respective church leaders. A.W. Tozer says that our churches are filled with 85% of people that are not saved. Billy Graham, he estimates that our churches are filled with 90% of people that are not saved. Now, there are others too. But if you don't want to take Toja's word for it, Billy Graham's word, we can take what the scripture says. Shows a picture of people that think they are saved, but they are not. I suppose, Sister Nancy, Matthew 7, 22 and 23. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Well, that certainly would be a shock. Now, we could paraphrase and people would come to the Lord and say, didn't I, um, didn't I go to church? Didn't I volunteer? Didn't I give money? The Lord said to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. So we have to understand exactly what it means to be saved so that we're on solid ground. Now, there is one other perspective that I want us to consider being saved, and that is from the perspective of the love of God. See, being saved, when it comes right down to it, is really not about us as much. It's about a loving, heavenly Father who wants only the best for us. And as proof of it, he gave his only begotten son, his only son to be tortured, to be uh, brutally tortured, the uh, skin ripped off his back. I don't know how he endured it, but he did it so that we could be saved. Oh, Sister Nancy, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Well, we have all heard this scripture many times, but you got to hear it. You got to hear it in your heart. Now we'll go and, and get that other one, number nine. This is Matthew 121 again, and we're going to launch right into this. You could read it whenever you get it. Uh, she will bear a son okay. and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins okay so what is the Lord saying here we'll look at it in detail first of all his people you know when God saves us we become his sons and his daughters you're a child of God and you approach him you know, not as father in a general sense, but you approach him as daddy. He loves the world. 
That's why he gave his son to save it, as we, uh, we just read. But do you know God does not love the world the way he loves you or me if we're saved? No, he loves us very, very special. And I will illustrate this this way. Um, Hunt, could you get me a box of tissues? I'm sorry. I'm going to illustrate this this way. I know. Oh, good. Oh, good. I know this uh, woman for many years. She has taught school. Oh, she's a fine teacher. Loves the children. And um, spends her own money buying them stuff. And uh, but one year in her classroom, there was a very special child, namely her own daughter. <laughs> okay, she loved all the kids, but this was her own daughter. And um, see, God loves all people. Every good and perfect gift comes from God, from above. If men, being evil, know how to give good gifts to their children, how much will your heavenly Father give good gifts to them that ask? He pours out his rain, his blessings, his sunshine, the scripture says, on the just and the unjust alike. But nevertheless, when you're saved, you're special. You're special. Now, he saves us from our sins. He saves us from the sins. You know, all the world's problems are the result of sin. You got the oppression of the poor, genocide, you have wars, you have all this international slave trading goes on, and that's a result of sin. Now, here's a point I'd like to make. Now, many, if not all, of your problems and my problems have to do with sin have to do with sin. Now I want to say your problems are due to sin. They are not due to bad choices. No, they're not due to bad choices. See, whenever anyone has spoken to me and used the term bad choices, they always really meant bad consequences of the choices. They say bad choices, maybe you think it's a bad choice, but really you're riveted on the horrible consequences of the choices. And um, see, sin, if you made a sinful act and you got thrown into prison or, or whatever happened, or any sin, and you got punished for it, you would call it a bad choice. But if you commit a sin and benefited by it, you wouldn't be talking about that bad choice. I've seen it. We've all seen it. If you commit a sin and get away with it, well, it's no longer a bad choice. Maybe it's a good choice. Now, we could look at a certain scripture, 2 Corinthians 7.10. I'll tell you what a bad choice means according to the Bible. It means... Death, the sorrow of the world. Why don't we read that, Sister Nancy, 2 Corinthians 7.10? For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. Well, you see now this um, bad choice thing, I think, you know, the Bible is one step of, ahead of our culture. <laughs> Whoever wrote the Bible knew that people would be trying to cop out of sin and saying it's a bad choice. So this verse is there. It leads to death. It does not lead to being saved. Looking at your sin as a, as a bad choice does not look, does not lead to being saved. Okay, so now Jesus is saving our people from his sins. What is sin? All right, in a general sense, they say sin is missing the mark. But frankly to me, that's more like saying a bad choice. It's too general. Here is what sin is. It's very clearly outlined. Specifically, any transgression against the revealed will of God in the Bible is sin. Breaking the Ten Commandments. That, no, that's sin. Now, regardless 
off. You break any of the Ten Commandments, there's other ones too. But regardless of our cultural standards, regardless of human logic, regardless of your personal feelings, any disobedience against the Ten Commandments is sin. And by the way, that was in the Old Testament. When Jesus arrived, you know, he raised the bar. <laughs> he raised the bar. Any disobedience, let me put it this way, to the Spirit of God, that small, still voice that's in the side of us, that is sin. In the Old Testament, you couldn't kill. Now you can't even be angry at someone. Could not, be, uh, could not commit adultery. Now you can't even lust. Go oh, on and on and on. But I have disobeyed that same that small, still voice, I have also obeyed it. And I could tell you, oh, obedience is, uh, is better <laughs> to obey it. I, I'm not going to go into it. It was going to be a long message anyway. All right. Sin is reprehensible. It is not to be taken lightly because sin costs the innocent son of God his life. All right. So now we're going to look at how you're saved from your sin. First, you're saved from the power of sin. And, uh, you know, sin has, a, um, sin has a power over people. Why don't we read uh, John 8.34, Sister Nancy. Listen, listen to this. This is with Jesus speaking. Jesus answered them. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. You just can't stop. It's I got you. And the Romans six fourteen, uh, uh, please, Sister Nancy. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law but under grace. Well, you see, there it is. You know, sin has you in its dominion. Now, when you get saved, the Spirit of God enters you and you are no longer under the dominion of sin. You still may have struggles, but now you have the ability to defeat sin. It's called divine enablement. You have the ability to defeat sin, whereas before you didn't. All right, now you're saved not only from the power of sin, but you're saved from the penalty of sin. Now, we all know that sin has consequences. The Bible says the wages of sin are death, and these consequences are not only in this life, but the consequences of sin are in the next life also. And uh, as we discuss the consequences, or I should say the penalty of sin, we're going to examine the here and the hereafter. Now, as far as um, in this life, when it comes to the consequences of sin, if you're a child of God, God does not deal with you. He doesn't give you what you deserve. Let's put it that way. He does not give you what you deserve. We could read Psalm 103.10 and then 11, uh, too. Please, Mr. Nancy, Psalm 103.10 and 11. Then I'll comment on them. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth... So great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. Well, you see there, he, his love toward those that fear him, it means reverence, love. Though his love toward his children, let's put it that way, is so great that he does not give us what we deserve. Almost all the time. I had a mentor. He said, I don't know what I'll do. He's a preacher for 60 years. He says, I don't know what I'll say when I meet the Lord. But one thing I will not say is give me what I deserve. And uh, isn't it something how some people are so into entitlement? 
give me what's mine. Give me what's mine. Well, if God, if God ever gave you what yours, uh, <laughs> you'd regret it. And uh, uh, that next one now, Romans 8.1. And I'll explain this a little. There is now, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Oh, 8 2 also, I'm sorry. I had a for the law, the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Well, there it is. There is, well, we're going to fall. But when we make mistakes or slip ups, uh, the Lord does not want us to be condemned. He wants us to pick ourselves right up and to uh, try again because we are not under the law of sin and death. That's where you do this, you get this. You do that, you get that. But we are what they call under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That means when we're condemned, when we're adjudicated guilty and awaiting punishment, well, God, he pardons us. So long as we're sincere and as long as we repent after our sins and as long as we determine to try again and do better, there is no condemnation to be feared. All right, now, so these are how God saves us from the, uh, the penalty of our sins in this life. Now, what about the hereafter? You know, it is appointed for men once to die and then the judgment. It's in the scriptures, once to die and then the judgment. And that judgment is eternal. And it is either heaven or hell. It's either eternal bliss. Maybe that Revelation 24, please, Sister Nancy. Listen to this. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Well, we have to read what Jesus said about about the other place. How about that next one, Mark 9? Where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Well, what this speaks of, and it speak, mentions this in another place in the Bible where people want to die, but they can't. They want to die, but they can't. And um, hell is a place of eternal conscious torment but it's not for the saved it was never meant to even be populated by men although it will be it was made for the devil in his and his angels now when you pass into eternity you're going to hear Jesus say well done thou good and faithful servant or he will say, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. There are only two choices. And um, according to what Jesus said, hell is a real place. It's not some figurative um, representation, symbolic. Hell is a real place. How about Revelation 20.10, Sister Nancy? And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Tormented day and night forever and ever. And these are not my words. These are not man's words. These are God's words. Now, let us uh, look at uh, Revelation 2015. Now, that's the next one. Revelation 2015, please. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Well, the first one was about the devils, and men will be right there with them. Now, you don't have to go there. You can be saved. You can be saved from the power that sin has over you and from the penalty that awaits unrepented sinners. 
So I want to just go through a few things. How do I get saved? What really must I do to be saved? You can get Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 ready. Uh, you know, salvation is God initiated. It's not like man decides, like you wake up and say, ah, I was going to go to Walmart, but I think I'll get saved today instead. It doesn't work like that. The Holy Spirit has to work on you and you have to respond. God is not willing that any should perish. Why don't we read Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, please, Sister Nancy. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not a result of works, so that no one may boast. See, God is constantly wooing us. He's asking us to be saved in different ways. And anyone that's in this sanctuary right now, it's clear the devil didn't tell you to go to church today. <laughs> I don't think men go to church on their own because the scripture said that the natural mind appreciates not the things of God. So it had to be God drawing you here today. It had to be. Because there's only three possibilities. God wanted you here today. And he wanted you here for a reason. And he is constantly wooing us trying to get us to be saved. So how do we get saved? All right, I have some, yeah, maybe four things you have to do. It's not many. The first thing is that you must acknowledge that you are a sinner, not a decider of poor choices. You are a sinner. And... Um, we cannot compare ourselves to others, make us look good, you know. We cannot compare ourselves to cultural standards. Why don't we look at Romans 3.23? It's very plain. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. And if we look at uh, James uh, 2.10, we'll see something else about sin that will uh, knock us off our high horses if we think we're not sinners. You could read that, Sister Nancy, James 2.10. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. Well, there it is. If you break one law, you're guilty of them all. So that is the first uh, step we must do to be saved. We must acknowledge that we are sinners and uh, there cannot be a, a vestige of self-righteousness. We are sinners. Now, B, number two, we must repent. What that I mean is we must turn from our sin and contrition tears. Believe it or not, that's not enough. Sometimes when you will really uh, truly repent, you do cry tears. I cry tears. But repentance means that you turn away from your sin and you walk in a different direction. Uh, how about 15, Luke, sorry, 15, 18. Oh, before you do that, you will remember the prodigal son. Now, this guy is one of the most famous stories in all of literature, not only the Bible. But this, uh, this young man, he, he takes his father, asks his father, you know, the father was rich. Listen, he says, um, what I, why can't I have my portion of the inheritance now? So he says, okay. And he goes out and he squanders the, the, the money. He uh, spends it. And then uh, he gets into trouble after he... Uh, finds he has no money, he has no friends, can't buy drinks for the bar anymore, the women, nothing. He's, uh, he's uh, impoverished, he has to work in a pig pen. Says that he even might want to, at times he wishes he could eat that pig food. But if we, here's what happened, he came to himself, and this is, his words are very important. Uh, 
Luke 15, 18, please, sister. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Well, if you can hear this young man's heart, this is true repentance. This is true repentance. So besides acknowledging that we're sinners, we must turn from those sins. Now, we also must realize that there is a penalty due. We have also, we have already, uh, now by the way, this is a penalty that we cannot pay. But if you read um, the next scripture, sister, Romans six twenty three, just the first part. For the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. This is, um, this is what we're entitled to. And, and we cannot pay. We not pay. Now, the, the fourth thing to be saved. Now, remember, you must admit you're a sinner. You must uh, repent from your sins. You must acknowledge that there are due deserts of your sin. You are entitled to be punished. You are worthy of being punished. There is no way around it. And finally, we must accept the unmerited, undeserved gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. You could read the next part, I guess, then Romans 6.23b. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. All right, so let me take a little breath here. So there are the four conditions, if you will, of salvation. But I want to just say, I'll go over them again, but these are not conditions of salvation, these four things. They're only evidences. I'm going to illustrate of salvation, evidence that you're saved. You must um, acknowledge that you're a sinner. You must um, repent of your sins. You must uh, see that, uh, that there is a penalty due. And you must accept the unmerited favor of God. What he did for you on that cross as the payment for your sins. And um, then a process starts. Salvation, you know, is a process. And the process of salvation, remember we already discussed salvation is not to get you a better lifestyle or me. The process that begins is to make us more like Jesus. And we're going to look at those two scriptures, Romans 8 and 28 and 29. This is the reason we're saved. Probably the reason that we, um, that we got converted Created, I should say. You could read that, Sister Nancy, Romans 8, 28. Just one, just one verse, 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. So the phrase, all things work together for your good. Do you know that every event in your life and mine is purpose? God's purpose. It says it right there. Everything that ever happened to you, good, bad, or indifferent, happened for one specific purpose. It was not random. It happened, Romans 8, 29, please, Sister Nancy. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Well, that is what everything in your life and mine has been working for, to conform us to the image of Christ, to conform us to the image of Christ, to make us more like him. And uh, you know, they say when a farmer is plowing his field, he has to have a fixed point. 
Otherwise, he, he'd be all over the place to make his furrow straight. That makes sense. You have a fixed point. Now, when it comes to salvation, brothers and sisters, this is the fixed point to become more like him. That's what we're aiming at. That's what things are. Ha could be good things, bad things, but they're working to make us more like Christ. Now, we're going to discuss false conversion and the, um, and the evidences of true salvation. I'm just going to give you five evidences of your... Of, but I have to just say this, and please don't misunderstand me. I'm going to give you the evidence of salvation, but they are not the conditions to get saved. Not the conditions. These are just evidences that you've been saved. Now, I just want to give a silly example. You know, um, when you get pregnant, you got a big belly, right? But the big belly don't make you pregnant. That's just an evidence that you're pregnant. You can't get a big belly and say, I'm pregnant. You got to be pregnant first and then you get the big belly. Now, here's the thing. If you're eight and a half months pregnant and you got no big belly, maybe you're not really pregnant at all. And if you um, are saved a number of years and your life doesn't show any of these five evidences, you have to ask yourself, am I saved at all? The same thing. Now, there are evidences that you are truly saved, and I'm going to give you five of them. But first, let me say, this is not a complete list. There are other things. Now, neither do you get these things immediately you get saved. You know, some of them take time, and I'm working on some of them right now after 40 years. But here are the five evidences that I chose that you're really saved. Number one, there should be a visible change in your life and it should be noticeable to others. If there's no visible change in your life, you have to ask yourself, am I saved? Now, changes, that could mean the friends you choose, what you do with your free time, how you spend your money, the jokes you tell, the jokes you laugh at, over and over and over. So there should be a visible change in your life as an evidence that you are truly saved. Now, on evidence number two, repentance means to go in the other direction. It means to just abandon your old ways and to, uh, and to take up new ways. Uh, we could read Matthew 3, 8, sister. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Bear fruit. Now, Jesus, uh, John the Baptist said this, bring forth fruit worthy of repentance to people that were coming to him to be baptized. You know, people want to get around, engage in religious activities. And if you came to a church and the pastor said, I'm sorry, brother, you got no fruit in your life. That's what John the Baptist did. These guys wanted to get in, baptized in their talk and all this uh, talk. He said, no, you brood of vipers, he said. Bring forth fruits not about words you must be and by the way the scripture says we should be a doer of the word not um not a, a, a hearer of the words so it's not just tears it's not just feelings and contrition repentance means you go in the opposite direction so that's the second of those five evidences of salvation now this one the third is forgiveness. Forgiveness. Now, I'm going to divide forgiveness into two parts. It's an evidence of salvation, but not only do you forgive others, 
but you must ask people who you have offended to forgive you. I did it. I did it. And um, I went to my uh, father-in-law who did not want me to marry his daughter. He went tears. He almost said, you're stealing my daughter. It didn't make any difference to me. I was like a stone. But it, when, it, when she had enough of me, oh, it designated me. When I got saved, I went to that man and I asked his forgiveness for wrecking that woman's life. And I did. I think my wife... Years later, I went again. You were with me. They were, anyway. Okay, so we ask for, we, we forgive others. Now, why don't we look uh, to Matthew, please, 523 and 524. I guess you can, you can, you can read them both. Um, so if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has some... Has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Well, you see what's happening there is that um, you need to ask someone's forgiveness. Let's put it that way. Now, I told you I went to my father-in-law. I asked him for my forgiveness. Uh, I was in my 40s and I had to go to my mother the Lord had me and ask her to forgive me for being a bad son now when you get these feelings um, if you obey them there's tremendous liberation tremendous liberation you won't be afraid of what people think you won't be afraid of anything like that if the Lord tells you to ask someone for forgiveness or apologize to them, you, you grow 10 feet in the experience. But we forgive others. You know, that's what Jesus did when he was hanging on that cross. He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. The Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. There's a guy in the streets. He collects cans called Ken the Can Man. He became saved. And shortly after that, these, a gang, a little, little gang, they beat him up. And um, he said that he had just got a little Bible at the railroad station. He said that I was praying for them while they were beating me up because the Bible said so. Now, that's amazing. I mean, a man could not do that. But yet, that's what Jesus did on the cross. Father, forgive them. That's what Stephen did. So we must forgive others. And we must also ask forgiveness of those that we have offended. So there we have three of these five uh, evidences of salvation. Change, a changed life repentance, forgiveness. Now we'll come now to number four, which is restitution. I did it. Repaying people, repaying them, that people that you have wronged. There's a story of this uh, converted man, and, and your sister Nancy will read it. You know, you'll see how he... Um, how he um, reacted. I hope I put Luke 19, 8 and 9. Sure. Yeah, you could just read them both, Sister Nancy. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house since he is also a son of Abraham. Well, you see the effect that salvation had to him. He, he, he said, if I have taken from the poor, and all those guys did, I will, I will restore a fourfold. Now, the final item about an evidence of salvation. Now, this is making difficult decisions for Christ. We all know that salvation is a free gift, but discipleship does have a cost. Jesus said it. He said that, count the cost. 
And um, making difficult decisions for Christ, you know, Abraham was willing to, to give up his son. Matter of fact, it says he got up early to do it. Got right on it, didn't uh, say, oh, was that God? Or let me call up uh, someone and ask him if I'm hearing from God. He got right on it. And um, I, I want to give you two quotes about decision making that have been oh so helpful uh, for me. They're both from business people. One of them was this guy, Steve Jobs. Oh, he was a tremendous, one of them, I think he might have been the best in the, tw you know, in the 20th century, 21st century, wherever we are, the best businessman based on his achievement. He was the president and founder of Apple. The place was going down and going to be obliterated. They got him out of retirement. He straightened the company out. But here's what he said about decision making. He said, very often, the biggest problems facing you are only a difficult decision that has to be made. Now, maybe you're uh, facing a difficult problem today. Maybe you don't know what to do. It's only a difficult decision. You'd be surprised how that could clear things up. I've been through this. And um, Roy Disney, he was the, you know, the corporate head of Disneyland, Disney World. Here's what he said about decision making. Uh, I forgot to write it down. Oh, yes. He said, decision-making is easy if you know your values. So I just pray that the Lord ground us in what it is to be saved so that we know our values and that we can make those difficult decisions that we can work out our salvation in fear and trembling that it's not only a one-time event, but it's a continuing process. And that we're willing to set our sights, not on getting rich or getting healed, but we set our sights on becoming more like Christ. Well, Father, I thank you for meeting us today, Lord. I know you did. And uh, I know that um, you're just so wonderful to always give us what we need when we need it, Lord. And I praise you, Lord. Amen.